last section in, eight, six, in chapter 8, and I think in a lot of ways it's the easiest section. It's one of those sections, it's one of those uh, sections that involves just one test. The test is called the alternating series test, and it's obvious when to use it because if the series alternates, you use the alternating series test. That's great, right? You're not trying to decide, should I use the root, should I use the ratio, is it a geometric, does it, um, does it need the integral test? So the alternating series test is the nicest because there's no question in your mind. If the series <coughs> is alternating, go to the alternating series test. And then it only has two little pieces to it. And so it, it, you'll, I think you'll like the alternating series test. In qu air quotes, you'll like it. You'll like it. Just like it's fun to be a Marine. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this one. So this is from the homework, and the uh, question is whether it converges or diverges. And it says to use the ratio test. Now, we could have assumed to use the ratio test anyway because we see factorials. As soon as we see factorials, 90% of the time, ratio test is the way to go. So with the ratio test, this right here is a sub k. And what we want to do is look at the ratio of consecutive terms. So we take the limit of the ratio of consecutive terms as k goes to infinity. <coughs> so if that's a sub k, we need a sub k plus 1 as the next term. So that's the ratio that we're taking the limit of. To find a sub k plus 1, we don't do anything too earth shattering. We just plug in a k plus 1. But here's where it gets tricky. So it's not complicated, but you just have to be careful with the details. So we're going to have k plus 1 factorial, and that's all squared. And now usually they're going to not want to put a, a square right on the exclamation point, so they'll do it like that. <coughs> and then the denominator there. Okay. That k is turning into a k plus 1. And that k is within parentheses and it's multiplied by a 2. So let's be really cautious here. So we're replacing the k plus, re replacing the k with k plus 1. So I'm going to put that in parentheses. And then all of that is factorial after you've multiplied by the 2. So in the denominator, it's really 2k plus 2 factorial. And that's a very common place to make a mistake. You look at that and you say, okay, I'm going to replace k with k plus 1, and you write it as 2k plus 1 instead of 2k plus 2. Super easy to make that mistake. But that 2 right there is being multiplied by k, so if you replace k with k plus 1, that 2 needs to be multiplied by the whole quantity k plus 1. All right, so there's the numerator. Dividing by a sub k means multiplying by the reciprocal. So then a sub k will be reciprocated, and that will be over here on the right. Yeah, we got that. All right, so any questions on that substitution of k with k plus 1 and rewriting it? Does it look okay? Let's go. So now we have to do some cancellation. Before we cancel, though, I think we should probably rewrite one, one more time. So we have the limit. <clears throat> we, let's separate some of the things that we see up here. Uh, let's, so right there, we have the k plus 1 factorial squared. I'm going to just separate it out into a bunch of products. So I'm going to write it as k plus 1 factorial <clears throat> over. And I'm also noticing I see a k factorial. Well, let's just write this up first. There, there's a couple of different ways we could go to simplify this, but let's just <clears throat> write out exactly what we, what we have here before we start canceling anything. And then we have a multiplication by 4 and a multiplication by 2k factorial. And then down below, Here's the part that's probably the trickiest. So this is 2k plus 2 factorial. And 2k plus 2 factorial 
is 2k plus 2 times 2k plus 1 times 2k factorial. That's a really common spot to, have a, to make a mistake. So let's make sure that we clearly see that. So 2k plus 2 factorial. Remember, factorial, you just keep subtracting 1 until you get to 1. So you keep subtracting 1. So 10 factorial, 10, subtract 1, you get 9, subtract 1, you get 8. So here, 2k plus 2 factorial, we start with 2k plus 2, and then we subtract 1. To get to the subsequent factor, you subtract 1. So that's going to be 2k plus 1. <clears throat> to get to the next factor, you subtract 1 again. And if you want to stop the subtraction of 1, you just put the factorial wherever you want to stop. Like if we had 10 factorial, we could write it as 9 times 8 times 7 factorial. Or we could write it as 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 factorial. So you can always stop wherever you need to. And I stopped right there because I see that in the numerator we have a 2k factorial. So that will give us a little bit of cancellation. And then we have a 9 and then we have k factorial times k factorial. <coughs> and let's just separate them out. So we have it all split apart. So now we should be able to do some cancellation. So we certainly see, let's use the highlighter canceler. So we certainly see the 2k factorial and that 2k factorial goes away. Now, I probably should have been more strategic here. I probably should have written these as k plus 1 times k factorial and k plus 1 times k factorial, because then those two k factorials, we could wipe them out. So let's do that just above. Let's write here this as k plus 1 times k factorial, and this one is k plus 1 times k factorial. So if we do that, then we see that we have cancellation there and there. So those all go away. Okay, so let's do a rewrite now and see what we're left with. Maybe there's some more cancellation. Oh, certainly the numbers. Let's get rid of the numbers. So 9 and 9, 4 and 4. Let's get rid of those. So in our numerator, we are left with k plus 1 times k plus 1. And that's it, correct? Denominator, 2k plus 2 and 2k plus 1. And what about the 2k plus 2 here? Should I factor out a 2 maybe? That might be smart. 2 times k plus 1 times 2k plus 2. Uh, 2k plus 1. So we got that. All right, and now we can evaluate the limit. Cancel out this. And what's our limit then? You see it yet? If I rewrite it one more time, that limit is one fourth. Make sense? <laughs> so the the tricky thing probably is the rewriting of some of those factorial quantities. A couple of places there where you can easily get kind of tangled up. But if you think about it really carefully and you think about it this way that to get from whatever is in the parentheses that you're factorial and subtract one, subtract one, subtract one, and that should help you. So another one from the homework using appropriate test, and we see that there is a factorial in there. So probably the root test, excuse me, probably the ratio test, whenever there's a factorial, the ratio. That's the best way to cancel out those exclamation points. So ratio test. So let's try it. We'll do the limit as k goes to infinity. So we're going to do k plus 1 first. So that's going to be 12 to the k plus 1. And then k plus 1 factorial over k plus 1 to the k plus 1. Hopefully it's not like yesterday. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully no one gets slapped. 
Is that what happened? Someone got slapped. A librarian. A librarian got slapped. Who slaps a librarian? <laughs> and, and then they took a picture of him, and then like they really? like who did this? And then the guy went to math class, and they're like, hey, that's the guy that slapped the librarian. And the police tried to get him, and he bolted and ran away. <laughs> he ran through open space, and they captured him in open space out there. Oh, that's hilarious. So I was like, why? <laughs> Yeah, why do you slap a librarian? I know. He tried. He tried to. The uh, not the paying this late fee. <laughs> <laughs> They're easier to <laughs> like, I'm not paying that thirty-five cents. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So it was downstairs in the library. So it was in the in the public library, not the college library side of it. Um, so don't feel. Don't be afraid <laughs> to go to the library. <laughs> don't be afraid to go down to the library. <laughs> You'll be safe. <laughs> Just stay on the college side, the, ci the civilized side. Yeah, Maybe you don't want to wear your name tag. <laughs> oh, crazy. Who the heck slaps a librarian? <laughs> okay. Uh, so similar type of thing here. We got to sort of figure. We we have to unravel it, and and I think we've done a couple of these now. Let's focus on these two factorial quantities first. So. This factorial quantity and this factorial quantity, we can think of them as canceling except for a factor of k plus 1. Everybody okay with that? So k plus 1 factorial is k plus 1 times k factorial. So the k factorial will wipe out that. And then let's go with this one, 12 to the k. That will cancel with most of this. This is 12 to the k times 12, so it's going to take all that away and turn that into a 12. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. There's one extra factor of 12 in the numerator. And then that's about as much as we can. Oh, I guess we could do this if we want to look here. We have a k plus 1 right there. That k plus 1 can take away this 1 right here. This is k plus 1 times k plus 1 to the k. So one of the factors of k plus 1 can go away. All right, let's rewrite there and see what we have left. So in the numerator, we've got 12 and k to the k. 12 and k to the k. And in the denominator, we have k plus 1 to the k. Okay. Now, we can't cancel with those factors that have the k to the k thing, but we can do this. The 12 can come to the front, and we can combine those into the following. We can make that k over k plus 1 to the k. And that limit is as k goes to infinity. And then how do we figure out that limit? The power Log. Do the log in L'Hopital's rule. Mm -hmm. We've done that a couple times where we let y equal. Should I go through it one more time, or yeah, or you think you know where to go? Go through it one more time. Yes, please. So if we let y equal, the best thing to do is convert to x's. So if we convert this to x's, because we're going to use L'Hopital's rule, which involves derivatives, <laughs> so you should be differentiating a differentiable function. And discrete functions are not dis are not differentiable. So we do that, and we take the natural log of both sides. <clears throat> and then we take the limit of both sides, and on the left side, that limit gets pushed inside the log function. <clears throat> and on the right-hand side, we rewrite it just a little bit. So we rewrite it just a little bit because we want it to uh, fit in L'Hopital's indeterminate form. And so now it fits in L'Hopital's indeterminate form. We have 0 divided by 0 if we take the limit as x goes to infinity. We have 0 divided by natural log of 1, which is 0. So 0 divided by 0. <coughs> so L'Hopital's rule limit of the derivatives. So we take the derivative of the numerator and denominator. Derivative of the numerator. It's 1 over the inside, which means reciprocate the inside. 
And then we have to differentiate the inside. We'll use the quotient rule. Low d high minus high d low over low squared. Are you okay with that? So the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator are both 1, so that quotient rule is actually pretty quick. And then we get negative 1 over x squared for the derivative of the denominator. So all that will equal the limit of, in the numerator, these x's go away. And a factor of x plus 1 will go away. I'll go with that. And then one of the x's will go away. So we'll, let's see, let's use green. So that x right there will take away this exponent. And that leaves us with negative x in the numerator. So right now, there's only a 1 in the numerator, but we're going to divide by this fraction. So we multiply by its reciprocal, and we're left with a negative x in the numerator. And in the denominator, I think just 1x plus 1. That we can evaluate relatively easily. That is going to be minus 1. Good. So then we look to the left side of the equation, and we have to do a little bit of algebra. We can exponentiate both sides. So the limit of y, which was the original function we wanted to take the limit of, as x goes to infinity, will be e to the minus 1, which is 1 over e. And now we can make our conclusion. So let's remember what we were doing. So we were trying to figure out whether a series diverged or converged. And we were, wow, that's way back there. So we were right there. So we just found that the limit of this is 1 over e. So we end up with uh, 12 over e. And what's our conclusion then? We can go all the way up here. Oh my gosh, wait, hold on one second here. Oh yeah, I got left with that 12 because of that. For a second there, I was panicking that the 12 was supposed to have some other thing on it, but it canceled, so that's why we have that factor of 12. So that converges? Okay, so converge or diverge? Converge. Oh, and then mine, I forgot to put the 12 back in. Well, so the 12 is out in front though. So if you multiply a series by a number, that's not going to change whether it converges or not, right? And the 12, we can think of that 12 as factored. We factored, although, no, I, I take that back, actually. Because we didn't factor the 12 out of the series. We factored the 12 out of the limit. So you're right. So the 12 is in there. So what's our conclusion then? 12 divided by e, is it greater than 1 or less than 1? It's greater than 1. So then our conclusion is that we diverge. If there was a 12 here that we could factor out of the series, that's totally different. If you could factor 12 out of the series, that 12 wouldn't affect divergence or convergence. But this 12 right here, we didn't factor it out of the series. We factored it out of this limit, which is all part of the limit of a sub k plus 1 divided by a sub k. So that's still part of the end result for that limit. <clears throat> so we get divergence. <coughs> You feel like you can do those log limits now? No? <laughs> Done like 10. I mean, three. <laughs> OK. All right, <laughs> okay, you can do them now? All right, any other questions from the homework? Anything that you got tangled up on? So let's just do one quick last summary of series before we go to our last test, the alternating series test. First thing, we look at a series, and one thing that we have to remember is that the limit of this has to be equal to 0, or it does not exist. It diverges. So the sum of the series doesn't exist. The sum of the series it diverges, however you think of it. It doesn't converge. 
So the only way a series can converge to a number, the only way an infinite sum can have a finite result, is if the limit of a sub k is zero. So that's first and foremost. The limit has to be zero. All right. And so this is an example where uh, the limit is zero, but it doesn't converge. So it's comparable. Let's remember our base, some of our basic series. The most basic series we deal with is the harmonic series. And the harmonic series diverges. <coughs> so the harmonic series diverges, even though the, the <coughs> limit of a sub k is in fact zero, right? The limit of a sub k is zero there. Those terms are going to zero, but it still diverges. They don't go to zero fast enough. <coughs> the harmonic series is an example of a p series. So a P-series is a series that looks like that. And when P is 1, you get a harmonic series that diverges. If P is bigger than 1, converge or diverge? Converge. Converge if P is bigger than 1. It can just be a tiny, tiny bit bigger than 1. It can be 1.0001. That's enough. It will converge. So. A smidge bigger than 1, and you have convergence. So if it's equal to 1 or less than 1, it diverges. So that's one of the special series. We also had the geometric series and the telescoping. Those were special. Those are extra special because you can actually tell what they converge to. So telescoping and geometric, extra special. Uh, and then one of the other things we did was the integral test. The integral test is actually how you show that a p-series converges when p is bigger than 1. Because this is an integral. We did an integral, improper integrals at the end of the last chapter. And then we did them again here. So you can integrate that. So it's one thing to keep in mind. If you look at the sum and, and it looks like the sum and is integral, you could use the integral test. Now, obviously, if there's a k to the k or a k factorial, you don't even consider the integral test. But if you have something like 1 over k to the fourth, yeah, that's a reasonable thing to go with the integral test. Uh, then uh, we had the um, ratio and root tests. So those, I really want you to think about those lumped with the geometric series. The geometric series, the root, and the ratio, those are all tied together with the 1. Again, with 1. If the ratio or the root or the common ratio is less than 1, you have convergence. All right? So for a geometric series, you have convergence if it's less than 1. So we just have to contrast that with the p-series. So p-series, bigger than 1 converges. So, but let's think about what it means. So when that p is bigger than 1, it means the denominator is getting big. So the fractions are getting small really quickly. Right, so when that p gets bigger, it's making the fractions go to zero faster. But with the other three, we're looking at ratios. We're looking at the ratio of consecutive terms. Pretty much in all three of those, it's essentially the ratio of consecutive terms. And that ratio has to be, we want that to be less than 1 for convergence. Okay, so 1 is an important number. Greater than 1 there, we have convergence. But with the root, the ratio, and the geometric series, less than 1 is convergence. So that's kind of, those are the main tests that we look at. And then this last one we look at is called the alternating series test. And again, in a lot of ways, this is the simplest one uh, for a, a variety of reasons. The first is that you know when to use it. If you see that switch, that helps. That gives you the sense that it's an alternating series. And quite frequently, alternating series uh, will kind of be obvious whether they converge or not once you see what the two steps are. So first we're going to just define an alternating series and we're going to look at a super common alternating series. And it's another one of these basic series that you just want to have in your head because we have some concepts that we're going to talk about in the next chapter, in chapter 9, that we we'll be looking at and having the, the sense of the harmonic and the alternating harmonic embedded in your head will help a lot.
So when we look at this, that's an alternating series right there, and it does converge. And it, it's one of those ones that you can calculate that it converges to natural log of 2. Not easy, but it does cal you can do it. <coughs> OK, so if we look at the sequence of partial sums, whenever we have a series and we want to know if it converges or not, you're really asking, does the sequence of partial sums converge? So here's what the sequence of partial sums looks like for this alternating harmonic. I've got a visual here also. <coughs> OK, so if we start with the first term, the first partial sum is just the sum of the first term, which is just 1. Sum of the first two terms is 1 half. Sum of the first three terms is 5 over 6. Sum of the first four terms, 7 over 12. And what you notice is that with an alternating series, this is the sequence of partial sums here. So the first, the first term in the sequence of partial sums is 1. And the second one is, uh, where did I go? Second one is 1 half. Oh, th this is a picture. I've got to back up a second here. I can't quite see what I'm looking at. How come that is minus 1 half? Oh, because I'm looking at a different one than this here. Do you see that they have a k plus 1 up there? Oh, no, they're starting at I'm confused. <laughs> they're starting at 1. Oh, this is just the sequence of terms. It's not the sequence of partial sums. The, the, these are the terms. Or are they? It says the sequence of partial yeah. sums. Yeah. How come the sequence of partial sums is that? 1, and then 1 half. Oh, yeah, it is. That's 1 half right there. I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what I'm looking at. So the sum of the first term is just 1. You add up the first two terms, and you get to 1 half. That's that 1 half. I don't know why I was confused. The sum of the first because three terms is 5 over across, 6. Because you thought it crossed to 0. I think that's, that's what I was looking at. That line right there, I was thinking yeah. of that as the x-axis. Yeah. 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 That's positive 1 half right there. That's not yeah. negative yeah. 1 half. Yeah, that's showing us the natural log of 2. So this oh. number on the y-axis right here, that's natural log of 2 right there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, now I, yeah, thank you. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's the x-axis right there. I was confused too. Don't yeah, don't worry. oh man. So there's a 1, and then uh, the next sum, so this is 1, and then we subtract off a half, so we're a positive a half. And then we add a third, then we subtract a fourth, we add a fifth, we subtract a sixth, we add a seventh, we subtract an eighth. So you can kind of see that with an alternating series that converges, you can see how it's oscillating about that number that it's going to converge to. It's getting closer and closer, first above, then below, then above, then below. So that's a feature of an alternating series that converges. Your sequence of partial sums is going to oscillate above and below. All right. Now. Does it make sense? Let's suppose that we stopped after, let's go four terms. So we've added the first four terms together, and we are right here, OK? So now when we add the fifth term, we add the fifth term. That's going to take us from this position all the way up to there, correct? Do you agree that the length of that dotted segment there is our fifth term? So in our case, it would be plus one fifth. Our fifth term is plus one fifth. Do you see what I'm saying? So here's the first term, one. We subtract off a half got to there, then we added a third, we subtracted a fourth, and now we're adding a fifth. So the length of that dotted segment is one-fifth. Everyone okay with that? One-fifth. Now, do you see that the difference between S sub 4, S sub 4 is the sum of the yellow dots, do you see that that sum is closer to natural log of 2 than the length of that segment? Do you see that it's closer to the natural log of 2? So the distance between that number right there is representing S sub 4. We've added up four terms in our series. And ln of 2 is the actual sum of the series. So the difference between S sub 4 and ln of 2 which we would call the remainder, 
So that right there, that distance right there is the remainder, so that would be called R sub 4. We added four terms together, and that distance to the actual sum would be the remainder for S sub 4. Do you see that the magnitude yeah. of that is smaller than the magnitude of that? Yeah. Okay, so this is a super important concept with the alternating series. So if we add four terms together, we are this close to the sum that we're trying to get to, but if you add the next term, the next term is actually bigger than the remainder. So what this tells us about an alternating series is that the magnitude of the subsequent term is a good estimate of the, remain, of the, of the remainder. So for example, we, if we look at this alternating series and we're told it converges to natural log of two, if we look at these two terms, that's S sub two, it's one half, this will be, this is, I should write it on the board actually, because this is such an important concept and it sometimes takes staring at it uh, quite a few times just to actually comprehend what it means. Can you say it in English one more time? Yeah, I will. <laughs> I'll say it in English. Try. It's like the magnitude of the next term is it good as the magnitude of the subsequent term is an estimate of the error the estimate of the remainder so uh, here I'll write it out in multiple times here so s sub 2 is equal to 1 half so there is s sub 2 <sighs> all right so s sub 2 is within one third of natural log of two. So the subsequent term after we've added those two is one third. We will be less than one third of a unit away from the actual sum of the series. So we can say that the error, it's a loose error because there's, there's actually a pretty big difference here. You know, that, that dotted line segment and that red segment, they're, you know, they're, they're actually quite, they're visually different for sure. So this is a very general estimate of the error. So now if we go to S sub 3. S sub 3, we add up the first three terms. And what is that? Common denominator of 6. So we have 6 over 6 minus 3 over 6. That's 3 over 6 plus 2 over 5 over 6. So what is that? That's going to be within how much of ln 2? 1 fourth. 1 fourth of ln 2. And if we go out one more term, we go S sub 4. S sub 4 is 7 twelfths. That's going to be within 1 fifth of ln 2. So what this gives us is a very concrete way to estimate how far out in a series you have to go to get a particular accuracy. All we have to do is consider the next term. That's it. So if we go out, um, do I have the series written up there? No, Let, let's look right here. So if we go out, oh, and actually it's super easy with the alternating harmonic. So if we go out 50 terms, so if we go out 50 terms in the alternating harmonic, S sub 50 will be within, how much of ln2? Yes. Yeah. We'll be within 1 divided by 51 of the actual sum of the series. So it gives us a very simple way to figure out how accurate your estimation is. And we're going to see a few problems like that in a minute where we say, compute the accuracy to within 1 10,000. So then we just have to figure out which term is the first term to be less than what we want it to be. So we'll do that in a minute. But first, the concept, getting the concept down is, is really important with an alternating series. That the subsequent term is more than the remainder. The absolute value of the subsequent term is more than the remainder. And you can see it very easily visually. So if we add up these first four terms, the remainder is just the length of that red segment. 
But the next term is going to bump you way up to there. So the magnitude of that subsequent term is more than the remainder. So that gives you a reasonable estimate on, on the approximation of your series. Okay. Now, the alternating series test. There's only two pieces. And these pieces couldn't be nicer. All we need for an alternating series to converge are these two things. I like looking at the second one first. The limit has to be 0 of a sub k. And notice one difference. When we talk about most series, with most series we call the whole sum and a sub k for most series. For an alternating series, they do it a little differently. They want to distinguish a sub k from the, from the switch over here. So they keep those separate. So for an alternating series, a sub k doesn't mean the entire sum and. It just means the stuff to the right of the sign change. So a sub k, slightly different meaning here. It's not the entire sum and. It's just whatever is there besides the minus 1 to the k or k plus 1. OK, so this is directly from the harmonic, excuse me, from the uh, divergence test. The limit of a sub k has to be 0. We already know that. There's no way a series can converge if a sub k doesn't go to 0. That's, that's something that we already have in our mind. So if that's true, if the limit is 0, and the only other condition is this, that the terms have to be getting smaller. This says, again, I don't like the way they write. I, I would prefer to write it this way, because this is the order of the terms. You're, you're at a sub k, and then you move to the right, and you're at a sub k plus 1. And if they're getting smaller, you have convergence. You only have two things to test. You just have to test that the limit of a sub k is 0, and you have to <coughs> test that subsequent terms are smaller. So technically, they say that it's non-increasing. In practice, we're going to see that it's decreasing. It's really, really hard to build a series with terms that you know, are something like 2, 2, 2, and then 1, 1, 1, and then half, half, half. You know, usually, it's just 2, 1, half, third. You know, they're decreasing 99% of the time. To create a series that's truly non-increasing, that's not decreasing, you, you can't just do it in a very easy way. So. If we can show that the series is decreasing and the limit is 0, done. Convergence. So let's look at this one right here. Alternating harmonic. Is it obvious that it converges according to those rules? Yeah, a sub k is going to 0. 1 comma 1 half comma 1 third comma 1 fourth, that's going to 0. And the terms are getting smaller in magnitude. That's it. Two things. Limit is 0, and the terms are getting smaller in magnitude. That's it. Then it converges. So let's look at this one. Now, if this minus sign was not up here, if we didn't have a switch up here, switching between plus and minus, would it converge or diverge? Is it a P-series? If you take away that thing up there, take away, just, just uh, ignore. Ignore that for now. Pretend that's not <laughs> Whoa. That's gone. So, so would that I'll diverge or converge? 1 over k to the 1 half. Diverge. Diverge because k is raised to a power that's less than 1. So we only get convergence for a p-series if the power on k is greater than 1. So that would diverge. But with this alternating sign up there, we're going to have a situation that's not dissimilar the, to that. Because right? as k increases, the denominator increases, so the fractions decrease. So we have to test two things. Let's test both things. So the first step in the test, we have to decide whether a sub k is greater than a sub k plus 1. In other words, are the terms decreasing? I don't know. Let's check. So remember that a sub k does not include the sign. So right now we have a question. We want to verify that this is true. 
And this is the technique I usually use. Put a question mark over it. I want to decide whether that is true or not. We're only dealing with positive numbers now, so we're allowed to multiply. So we can multiply both sides. So this is equivalent to asking this question. Is the square root of k plus 1 greater than k? And we just get down to a point where there's an obvious yes or no answer. And for some of us, it might be a little further than others. It doesn't matter. If it's still not 100% clear, you can square both sides. We have positive number, positive number. You can square both sides. And you can always get down to a place where it's obvious. If it's still not obvious to you, drop out. If it's still not obvious, subtract k. <laughs> no, here's the step where if that's not obvious, <laughs> then drop out. <laughs> if one, if, yeah, change your major. If you, can, if you don't know that 1 is greater than 0. So then we see down here, we get to a point where we can easily verify by inspection that it's true or false. So our goal is to figure out whether this is true or not. And that's step one, and it, it's true. So that means that we're probably dealing with a convergent series. Um, for a to the k plus one, why didn't you change the number? <coughs> a sub k plus one. Not a to the k plus one, a sub. So a sub k plus one. This right here is the switch. This is the just the sign. So that's not part of a sub k. a sub k is everything. So if we rewrote this uh, so that there's the switch, and then it's multiplied by that. So a sub k for, a, for, a, for an alternating series doesn't include okay. the minus 1 to the k or the k plus 1. We ignore that. That's not part of a sub k. Austin? So this test is just showing us that the magnitude of the term is getting smaller. Mm -hmm. That's it? That's it. Two steps. The magnitude of the terms is getting smaller. And then the second step, the, magnitudes of the, the magnitude of the terms is getting smaller and going to zero. So not only are they getting smaller, but they're also going to zero. So our second step, we take the limit as k goes to infinity of a sub k. So again, a sub k is just this part. We don't include the sign. And yeah, that's going to be 0. Right? The denominator is getting bigger and bigger with that bound. And so the fractions are getting smaller and smaller, closer and closer to 0. Can you, so why exactly don't we include the top bit? Uh, the minus 1 to the k? Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the, the, so the series is broken into two pieces. It's broken into the magnitude of the terms and then the sign. Okay, so that, that part we can just kind of like... You can just ignore the, the minus side. thing okay. because this dictates totally the magnitude of the terms. You could, if you wanted to include it, you could, but then you put absolute value bars around it and then it would go away anyway. Okay. <laughs> so... If our test would be false... Bless you. So if that... So great question. If this was not true, what would that tell us? Can we conclude divergence, or would we be in a place where we're inconclusive? What would it be? Inconclusive. Divergence. <laughs> Wait, you said both answers. That way she's completely so, right. So if I gave three choices, would you have said all three? <laughs> I've done that on a scan before. Did it work? I have no idea. So my son, he's in this algebra class. And, no, no, it's in this biology class. He's in this biology class, and they had to, they had to do a test. There's a whole bunch, there's like 50 of those Scantron questions. And he came back after the day after the test. He's like, man, some of you guys are worse than a coin. <laughs> it's like a coin would have done better than you on the Scantron test. <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> That's like the strangest thing a to coin. insult someone about. Yeah, I was going to say. Coin? Man, you're worse than a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, a coin has two sides, man, so it would have picked one or the other, right? Yeah, so yeah there were true false questions. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They yeah. were true oh, false questions. I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just They were true false <laughs> questions, and half the class missed more than half. So, can you tell them to drop out, or what? So, <laughs> 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 so savage.
<laughs> All right. The uh, <laughs> the uh, so the the limit here. You don't need the minus one thing. Even if you had the minus one thing in here, the limit would be zero anyway, because that minus is not going to change whether the limit is zero or not. And here, if you did include the minus thing, you would just be taking absolute values. The, the goal is to test the magnitude of the terms. And so the thing that they do with an alternating series to make that convenient is that a sub k represents the magnitude of the terms, and the minus one to the k or k plus one is just the alternating piece of it. And we don't even need to consider that for these two, for the limit or the comparison. Kelly? So, uh, I don't know if we answered the question. If it, if it fails, does it, go, does it automatically convert or into a diverger? And, and that's what the question was. Yeah, that's what the question was. That's oh. where we are. So back to present time, what do you think? So if this is not true, if this is false, so if a sub k, if, if the terms aren't getting smaller, it has to diverge if they're not getting smaller, right? If the terms stay the same or get bigger, you're in that situation, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. You know, if they're getting, staying the same or getting bigger, definitely diverges. So they have to be getting smaller and closer and closer to 0. And that's what we're showing here. So we're showing that they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and, smaller and closer and closer and closer to 0. So those two things, they have to get smaller and get closer to zero. So this thing is never going to get closer? This test, um, that's, a, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, it would, could we have this with a, no, I guess we could, um, that's a good question. Could we have a decreasing sequence of terms? And if that limit, yeah, no, it's not, yeah, there's no way. Yeah, it's always conclusive, converge or diverge. Yeah, yeah, good point. I thought of it that way. Okay, so our answer here is then therefore converges by alternating series test, we usually abbreviate, abbreviate that to AST. Converges by the alternating series test. And a lot of these limits will be kind of intuitive. You know, 1 over k squared, yeah, it's 0. So there's not going to be a lot of writing. But you need to write something down for each of the two steps so it's clear to me that, you are, that you're concluding that the limit is 0 and that you're concluding that the terms are getting smaller. So you have to write down something. Looks like a time zone. AST, like Australian <laughs> time or something. <laughs> Yeah, what's the new time zone they're creating on the East Coast? The Atlantic time zone? They are. They are. There's a big push for Massachusetts and Maine to be on the same time zone, but they're gonna, they would call it the Atlantic time zone instead of the Eastern time zone because it'd be an hour off from Connecticut, New York. And <laughs> Kinetic? Oh, oh, is that crazy? You just said Kinetic. Yeah, you just said Kinetic. Oh, what's it called? Connecticut. <laughs> oh, Connecticut. Yeah, yeah, that one. And there's hamburger all over the highway in <laughs> Mystic, Connecticut. <laughs> Mystic, Connecticut? Really? <laughs> Have you never heard that? No. Uh, that's from a thing called Fireside Theater. Oh, really? <laughs> it's really fun. Fireside or Fireside? Fire sign. Sign. Theater. Oh. It's so funny. I think it'd be easier just to be on a wolf box. I know. I know. So it gets so, it's so crazy. Some states are doing it, some states aren't. <coughs> oh, God. <laughs> what if you live in Massachusetts but you work in New York? <laughs> oh, God. Ah, it gets confusing. Uh, but wait, what if one of them doesn't uh, follow daylight savings? I, yeah, well, that's, that's what they want to do. They want to do. Maine and Massachusetts want to do. I know, but then when they change, they change what, if, what if one of them decides to stop? Like Arizona? Yeah, like Arizona. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. What? Yeah, there's half the year you're on California time, half the year you're on Colorado time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It woke me up an hour early. For a whole year? No, just for just that one day. But just one year, they decided my phone decided to do daylight savings time, even though I was in Arizona. Oh, interesting. So and I so I woke up and it was like four in the morning and I show up in the town. I'm like, oh, it seems awful like dead for five in the morning. Yeah. Oh, it's four. Why does my car say four? Were you near a border? I was in Flagstaff, yeah, so I wasn't like it. Was, yeah, it should have been fine, but. Technology. <laughs> we love it when it works. <laughs> I'm ready for it to be light a little bit early. Okay, so first step in the test is, are the terms getting smaller? So again, we ignore the minus one to the k. Just look at the other stuff. And we want to know whether this is true or not. So we replace the k with k plus one in the denominator. Now the cool thing about these inequalities is that everything's positive. So you can square both sides, you can multiply both sides by a common denominator, cross multiply. You don't have to worry about sign switching because everything's positive. Okay, so I'm gonna cross multiply. That seems like a logical thing to do. Cross multiply. And then we'll go from there and it's easier if you're looking at something that's not doesn't have fractions often. All right, so let's get to that. So just cross multiply. And maybe that wasn't the greatest idea, but it was an idea. <laughs> All right, so what can we? What, what what do you think we can do right now? Drop out. <laughs> it's too early. It's we're too gonna, early. We're gonna keep that joke going. Up. We're gonna go a little further. Don't drop out yet. Don't drop out yet. So, can we make a conclusion that the left side's bigger than the right side yet? Now, one thing that's funny about natural log, you've got to be a little bit aware of the of the way the natural log function grows. You know, at one it's zero, and then it starts to get bigger. Up there, we just have to make sure that we're, you know, down here it's negative, but because we're starting up here at two, we don't even have to worry about that even, because k starts at two, so we don't have to worry about any funny business with the log being negative. So let's break it into let's just glance at two parts. Like if you look at this and this, those two factors, which of those factors is bigger, the left or the right? K. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so k plus 1 we know is bigger than k. It has to be. What about uh, this? What about natural log of k plus 1 and natural log of k? k plus one. So natural log of k plus 1 is going to be bigger. If you look at the natural log function, if you're out here somewhere that you call k, if you go a little bit further to k plus 1, that's definitely bigger. And now the one thing that we have to be careful of is with squaring, because you know that if you square a fraction, it gets smaller. So you have to be a little careful there. And they did, again, say that we're going to start at 2. And what's the, uh, if we start at 2, once we get to 3, natural log of 3 is going to be, natural log of 2 is like less than 1. Yeah. But then natural log of 3 is bigger than 1. So we're going to be fine, because the smallest we would be is when k is 2. And so, question, Hannah? Wouldn't it be easier, instead of like going through all these steps, to just pick a number and plug it into the very first? Well, if you, pl you plug in a k value? That can give you a sense, but it doesn't prove it for all the k. You know, because what they'll say is, well, what if there's k's that did something different later on? So that, that's a good way to get a sense of whether it's true or not. And that's essentially what we're saying right here. When we say k plus 1 is bigger than k, it's because we know that if you pick k equals 10, then you have 11. If you pick k to be 50, you have 51. So you're kind of doing that, but, um, but you have to do it more in general to prove that it's true for all k. So right here, we know that that's bigger than that for sure. And then as long as k is you know, bigger than 2, this is also going to be bigger than that. So that would be you know, logic enough for us. Now, the book, if you look at the answer key in my math lab, sometimes what they're going to do is divide both sides, and they're going to try to analyze a ratio. They'll take the limit of the ratio and figure out if it's bigger than 1 or less than 1. 
So let me just explain that to you. I feel like reasoning things out is enough, but if, if you had this situation right here, if you wanted to show that A was bigger than B, uh, let's suppose that you divided both sides by A. Then what they're going to do is, if, to show that this is true, they're going to show that the limit of B over A is less than 1. So that's what they're going to, some of the, sometimes they're going to do that as their technique. Uh, it's a little more complex than I think you need to. I think most of the time you do what we've done here and you can see it pretty easily. So k plus 1, that's certainly bigger than k. And ln of k plus 1, that's bigger than ln k. Right, so here we can see that without getting that formal, taking the limit and showing that that limit is uh, less than 1. So that's enough there. So we're going to conclude that that's true. And then the only other step is to uh, take the limit of a sub k and show that that's 0. So we have to take the limit as k goes to infinity of 1 divided by k ln squared of k. We have to <laughs> conclude that that's 0. And Again, we have a denominator that's growing without bound and a numerator that's constant. That's one of those basic limits that we all just assume is 0, or that we conclude is 0. There's no more showing to that limit. You kind of learned that in Calc 1, that 1 over k goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. And, um, so we just assume it now. Nothing more to show. So therefore, we get convergence by the ASD. All right, let's take a break, and then we'll get to another one. Oh, All right, let's do another one. <laughs> Watch out for smart drivers out there. Rear wheel drive. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, so another uh, alternating series. We know it's an alternating series because of that minus one to the k plus one. So we want to show that the terms are getting smaller in magnitude. So we do what we just did before. We're going to replace all the k's with k plus 1. Replace k to the k with k to the uh, k plus 1 to the k plus 1. And that should be an inequality symbol. And we are asking the question, is that true? Is that true? All right, so let's do, uh, let's get the, this time let's do it, let's see, how should we do this one? Well, let's first do, <laughs> what's the easiest and quickest way? We can get rid of 1k plus 1 with that plus 1 down there. That would help us a little bit. I don't know. Can't you cancel the factorial? The factorials, yeah, let's go with the factorials. All right, good idea, good idea. So let's do this. So I'm going to move this one over to here. Gosh, if there's so many things you can just cancel out, it's like, where do we start? <laughs> we move it to the left, then we have to move it back to the right. Should we let's just do expand it, this it all first? Do what? Just expand everything. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Let's do that. Let's write it as k plus 1, k factorial. Right, this is k plus 1 times k plus 1 to the k. Yeah, that's a good idea. Expand it a little bit first. k to the k. All right, so any questions on that expansion stuff? Does that look OK? Then we'll cancel a k plus 1 with a k plus 1. We'll fact, uh, divide out a factor of k factorial. And then we'll cross multiply. And we should be left with something that we can conclude by inspection. So we get to that. And if you're still not 100%, take the kth root of both sides. If you're 
still not 100%. Divide, uh, subtract off a k. And then we get to a place where it's obvious. Yeah, that's not true. Good suggestion. Expand a little bit and then go for it. All right, so that's step one. This shows that the magnitude of the terms is decreasing. The, the sequence of terms, the magnitude of the terms is decreasing. And now we just have to show that that's decreasing to zero. So we take the limit of a sub k as k goes to infinity. And now this is one of those ones where we use that growth chart. We had that rate chart. And in that rate chart, they gave us some, some information about how fast these two grow. And what we saw was that the factorial grows fast, but k to the k grows even faster. So k to the k, k to the k, knowing that it has a fast, a higher growth rate. Can we just call rate. that cray cray now? Cray cray. <laughs> cray cray. <laughs> cray cray. So we know the limit is zero. So k to the k goes to infinity faster than k factorial. Funny, yeah, it's a funny function, k to the k. Some people call it what a tower, a power tower. Tower tower. Grand tower. Number, man. Tower of power. What do they call it? Power tower. A power tower. Yeah. Power tower. Power tower. Power tower. Therefore, converge by alternating series. I like this section. Right there, it's not crazy hard. Yeah. Like we said. Okay. Definitely, it's definitely manageable. Okay, so let's talk about the remainder of an alternating series. We talked about it a little bit already. And the, the summary of what we looked at before, and here they're gonna try to explain exactly what we looked at. Um, the key is that the remainder, the absolute value of the remainder is less than or equal to the subsequent term. So, Let's look at this picture again. Let's see if it makes even more sense now. So the idea is that we've got our s of n. So we've added up the first n terms, and we've ended up right there. And the limit of the, of the series is right here. So we know that the value of the series is that yellow line right there. And so when we add the next term, s sub n plus 1 is going to be below the sum of the series. because we're above it now, which means we just added a positive number. Now we're going to add a negative number. We're going to dip below the yellow line. And what they did was just slide over this S sub n so that we can see exactly what the, the jump is going to be. So S sub n is right there. S sub n plus 1 is right there. So this is the sum of the next term. This is the next term. It's negative whatever. Negative number that takes us from there to there. So the length of that. The distance between those two red dots is the magnitude of a sub n plus 1. Okay, so we've added up n terms. If we add one more term, it would be taking us to there. And the magnitude of that term is right there. But the remainder is only right there. The remainder for s sub n is the distance from s sub n down to the yellow line, which is the sum of the series. So there's r sub n. That's the remainder. And you can see clearly that its magnitude is smaller than the magnitude of that. So the magnitude of the remainder is less than or equal to the magnitude of the subsequent term. Everybody see that? So this right here is the, that's the remainder right there. That, the length of that blue segment is the remainder. It's the distance between s sub n and the true sum, s. So that's the remainder. But when we add the next term, we're going to the sum and through the sum. So the next term has a bigger magnitude than the remainder does. So that's how we're going to get good approximations. All right, anyone have a question on that? So the green one is representing the magnitude of a sub n plus 1, and the blue one is representing the remainder. And so the remainder is less than the subsequent term's magnitude. Piece of cake. All right, so let's see if it's still a piece of cake. We have a series. They tell us it sums to 1 over e. 
the sum of the series is 1 over e, about a third. And it says, how many terms in this convergent series do we need to add together so that the remainder is less than 10 to the negative 4 in magnitude? All right, so this is the question that we're asking ourselves. We're saying, all right, what does k need to be so that k, 1 over k factorial is less than 10 to the negative 4? That's what it's asking us. We're trying to figure out what is the k value that creates an, a, a, a term that is smaller than that? Let's cross multiply. You can think of this as 1 over 10 to the 4. So if you cross multiply, you would have this. So we're trying to figure out a k that creates a number bigger than 10 to the 4. 10 to the 4 is 10,000. So we want to know what the k is. Now, we're doing k factorial. And Desmos is, you can do it on your calculator, of course. Doing it on your calculator will work just fine. Um, but we've got to, there's a couple of things I want to show you on Desmos. So they have a, if you do a search, a Google search on sequences and series in Desmos, it will give you this uh, built-in sequence and series app. And you can, if you create, if you log into Desmos with your Google account, you can just save that in your, in your um, list of, of, uh, of um, worksheets. So I've just saved it. It's just sitting here on the top of my worksheets that I've saved under my account. And um, it's pretty cool. You can look and modify the a sub n. And when you modify the a sub n, it will graph both the sequence a sub n, which are the blue dots, and it will graph the sequence of partial sums. And it will go out as many terms as you want. So you can get a good visual sense of whether your series converges or diverges. Uh, so that's a, a cool little app. The other thing you can do in here, uh, let's see, I was going to just show you how you can use Desmos to do uh, some algebra type things. Like if we do 5 factorial, it just tells us what the answer is down there. So we're trying to get above 10,000, right? So 5 factorial didn't do it. Let's try 8 factorial. 8 factorial, oh, that's a lot bigger. 7 factorial, all right. So the first number that has a factorial greater than 10,000 is 8. So 8 is the first number that has a factorial greater than 10,000. Keep that in your mind. So this tells us that k has to equal 8. So when k is 8, we will have a fraction value here that's less than 10,000. Less than a 10,000. So that means that we add up all the previous terms. And if we add up all those previous terms, we will have a sum that is less than that. We'll have less than that in error. Yeah? Shouldn't that be k greater than or equal to 8? Uh, I mean, you could write that if you want. I mean, the, we're adding up the stuff that's in front of the 8, though. Oh, so we're, so just, we're just trying to find just the, the first, first k sum. value that gives us a number bigger than 10,000. So we want to add up all these numbers then from k equals 0 to k equals 8, Seven. 4, <laughs> 7. 7. Because <laughs> Seven. the k equals 8 gives us a number that when we plug in k equals 8, we're going to get a term that's smaller than 1 over 10,000. So we don't need that term. Because then it's the previous terms that will add up and give us that as the error, give us that as the remainder. So we're going to add up eight terms because it starts at zero. So we're going to add up the terms that go from k equals zero to k equals seven. Because the eighth term was smaller than our error. So we have k equals our zero term, our one term, our two term, our seven term. This term was less than 10 to the negative 4. So that gives us the error on the addition of all the terms up through k equals 7. So we are going to be adding 8 terms together, but it's not because k is 8. It's because 0 plus 1 plus 2 all the way up to 7 is 8. All right. So if this started at 1, 
we'd actually be adding the first seven terms together. If it started at two, we'd be adding the first six terms so together. Can that key just, we can take that up as of age? Not, uh, it, we, this is going to be S, yeah, it's going to be S sub eight. Yeah, S, S sub eight. eight. So that, we have to keep that in mind. If we start at zero, S sub one, you know, has um, just the zeroth term in it, where K is zero. So S sub 2 would be F with K equals 0 and K equals 1. S sub 3, K equals 0, 1, and 2. S sub 4, S sub 5. So we're going to do S sub 8 because we're going to add 8 terms together, starting with the 0th term. Okay, so now it says, uh, what does it say? So determine how many terms of the following conversion sequence. Let me some, although you do not need to need it, the exact value of the series is given. All right, so they didn't even tell us what, they didn't even ask us to add these up. Eight terms up to and including, just to be as clear as possible, k equals seven. So eight terms, we're gonna add up from k equals zero through k equals seven. Now the cool thing about this app over here, what is that k factorial? One, minus one to the k is that this can add those up for us really easily. If we go to that Desmos app right here, so uh, they use a capital N, so if I want to model the series that we had, it would be capital N factorial, and it was minus one in the numerator, raised to the capital N power. So what did we say? We want to go to eight terms. So if we go to eight terms, we're going to reduce that to eight. And then if we look down here, we can, if we wanted to, the, the red ones are showing us the partial sums. The purple ones are showing us the sequence terms. So if we want to know exactly what the sum of the first eight is, I'm going to hit show label on the red. That will show the values for the partial sums. And so the eighth one, when we add up the first eight terms, we get to a sum of negative 0.6321. Negative 0.6321. So S of eight will equal negative 0.6321. So that's a, a nice little feature that that Desmos thing, you don't even have to build the sequence, you just search, get that sequence, app, stick it in Desmos, and you can tell what it converges to. Otherwise, you can add up all eight terms. Plug in zero, plug in one, plug in two, plug in three, plug in seven, add them all up. Are you gonna make us do one of these on the test? Where you have to add them up? Yeah, without Not if it was more than three or four terms. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> No, you don't use the one over E. Well, in which case we have to use that? You the one over E? Yeah. You don't. Okay. Yeah, they were just they're, they're just giving it to us for the just for interest that that converges to one over E. Just to confuse us. No, not to confuse you, to intrigue you, not to confuse you, to intrigue you, to entrap you, to <laughs> smear you, to smear you. That's not what All right. I said. <laughs> what did you say? Ensnare. Oh, ensnare. That's such a clever word. Ensnare. Oh, how do they know it converges to pi cubed over 32? <laughs> mm. one of those, it's one of those pi squared over 6. Pi to the fourth over 90. It's one of those. Oh, yeah. Wow. Kind of like a Riemann Zeta. Well, there's no factorial in there. Yeah. Kind of a Riemann Zeta looking thing. Okay. So. Uh, they ask us the same thing. We want to know when is this, when is the value of the term less than 10 to the negative 4. So again, we'll cross multiply. And so the question that's a little more intuitive to figure out the answer to is this. So 10 to the 4 again is 10,000. So we want to know what's the k value that will get us there. If this was, if we wanted to get a ballpark, you could take the cubed root of the left side, subtract 1, divide by 2. 
Um, because 10,000 isn't a perfect cube, yeah, it's not, we don't, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. So 2K plus one cubed. So let's go back over to Desmos and go to this one. And so if we do, uh, let's do 20 cubed. That's 8,021 cubed, 22 cubed. All right, so there's where we're at. So 22 cubed is where we need to go. So 22 is the first number that has a cube greater than 10,000. So we are looking at that, and we set that equal to 22. Uh, and what's eleven? What's going to be? Huh? That's going to be. A Did I write that properly? Subtract one back. If I want that to be twenty-two, isn't uh, k going to be? K is not going to be a whole number. K is not going to be an integer. So when k is eleven, let's let's do it this way. When k is ten, we are going to get twenty-one cubed. When k is eleven we're going to get 23 cubed. And this will be the first k then. k equals 10 is not going to be enough. So we need k equal to be 11 to be greater than uh, 10,000. So k has to be 11. Make sense? Plugging k equals 10 is not quite enough. So k has to be 11. So when k is 11, so what this is telling us is that when k is 11, that's going to give us a term value that's less than 1 over 10,000. So we're going to add up all the terms in front of it to get an approximation that is as accurate as we want it to be. So we're going to add up S sub, <coughs> S sub what here? S sub 11? If that started at 1, it would be s sub 10. But it's k equals 11 that gives us, the, that gives us a, a term value of less than 1 over 10,000. So we want to add up everything in front of k equals 11. So k equals 0, which would be s sub 1. k equals 0 and 1, that would be s sub 2. 0, 1, and 2, s sub 3, 0, so s sub 11. So this is going to be for... I'm just going to call the term values a sub 0 plus a sub 10. <clears throat> and now I'm including, I'm being very general with the a's. I'm including the minus 1 here. We're adding up all the terms from k equals 0 to k equals 10. That's what I'm trying to represent over there. So the first 11 terms. then a sub 11 is less than 1 over 10,000 in magnitude. So maybe I'll say the absolute value just to emphasize because a sub 11 could be a negative. All right, that makes sense. So if we wanted s sub 11, if we went to that other Desmos app, we would just plug in 2k plus 1 cubed. 2k plus 1 cubed. So come right in here and there. 2k, 2k plus 1 cubed. And how many terms do we say we're going to go at? 11. So to there. And wherever the. Wherever <laughs> go the wrong way. Go no, home. it's around 1. There it is. Okay, so S sub 11 is, point, is negative point zero three one one. Negative point zero three one one. So that is within one ten thousandth of pi cubed over 32. Everybody follow that? Let me just write that last comment down because that's kind of the conclusion. So S sub 11 is within 
one ten thousand of pi cubed over thirty-two. All right. So estimate, I hear they're actually asking us for the values. They say estimate the value of the series with an absolute error less than 10 to the negative 3. So same concept here. We want to know what is the k value. Oh, that's the one I just entered too, isn't it? What is the k value that will create a term that's less than 10 to the negative 3? First thing I think that's a good thing to do is cross multiply. Now this one it makes perfect sense to take the cubed root of both sides because we have a perfect cube on the left. So let's do that. So we'll get 10 less than 2k plus 1. So 9 is less than 2k. So k is greater than 9 over 2, so k will be 5. 5 will be the first value of k where this thing is less than 1 over 1,000. Let's just make sure that that's true. So we have 2k plus 1 cubed. So when k is 5, that's 11 cubed, is that right? When k is 5, that's 11 cubed. equal to 11, that's what we're shooting for then. So k is going to be 5. And now if we go back to the other one, if we go out to, oh, that one starts at k equals, oh, what did our problem start at? So this one says k equals 1. So we're going to start at k equals 1. So how many terms are we going to go out then? So if k is 5, are we going s sub 5, s sub 4, s sub 6? S sub 5. S. So when k is 5, that gives us the error that we want. So we add everything in front of k equals 5. So we add up k equals 4, k equals 3, k equals 2, k equals 1. And it doesn't start at 0, right? It starts at 1 here. So we're going to add up the first four terms. So s sub 4 will be a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 plus a sub 4. So it's gonna add up, we're going to add up the first four terms. We're starting at 1. So let's go and uh, get that number. So if we just go out four terms. And now I'm realizing that this is starting at 1. And the last two that I wrote the estimate up there for, I think those ones started at 0, right? So I have one term that I'm missing. I can correct those as soon as we're done. OK, so uh, we are stopping at 4. And just a quick note, a sub n is where you enter the, your, the form of your sequence, the form of your terms. And they have an a and an r here just in case you're doing a geometric a sub n. So if you had a geometric one, you can put your a and your n here, your a and your r from there. All right, so let's go home and then shift and zoom. And so the red dot, negative 0 0.031. Negative 0 0.031. So that's going to be the sum of the first four terms. Now that one's probably easy enough just to plug in the 1, 2, 3, 4 and add them up. But if you're doing an S of 8 or an S of 9, it gets a little tedious. Okay, so any questions on that? 
So this is the sum of the first four terms. The fifth term is going to have a value that's less than 1 over 1,000. So that means that this number right here is within, let's write that final conclusion. So uh, S sub 4 is within uh, 1 over 1,000 of S. So S is the sum of the series. We don't know what it is in this case. They didn't tell us. Try this one, 44. So same idea, we want <clears throat> to figure out the k value for which 2k plus 1 factorial in the denominator is less than 1 over 1,000. Cross multiply first. <clears throat> Did we say that? Eight factorial or what? no no we were looking at ten thousand. We're doing those factorials. So let's go over to decimals, figure out our factorial that will work. So what is five factorial? One hundred and twenty. One twenty six factorial. One hundred twenty times six. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the first fact. <laughs> the first factorial that's bigger than 1,000 is 7. 7 is the first one that has a factorial. So we want this to be, if we want that to be a 7, k has got to be 3. So k equals 3. So k equals 3 generates the first k value that satisfies that. K equals 3. Certainly k equals 4 and 5 will satisfy it, but k equals 3 is the first k value. So k equals 3. So what terms are we going to add up then? How many terms? Yeah, 1 and 2. So k equals 3, and this starts at 1. So k equals 3 is the third term, so we only have to add up the first two terms to be within 1 over 1,000 of the actual sum. So we're going to figure out S sub 2. S sub 2 will be A sub 1 plus A sub 2. So if we add up those first two values, we can go over there and do it, or we can probably look here and do it easy enough. Let's do it here this time. So A sub 1 in the denominator, we'll have 3 factorial, and we'll have a positive 1. So we're going to have 1 over 3 factorial, so that's 1 over 6, plus, actually, we know it's going to be a minus. <clears throat> a sub 2, so when that's a 2, we have an odd power, so it's a minus 2 there. It's 5 factorial, and what we say 5 factorial is 1 over, is it 120? <clears throat> Multiply top and bottom by 20, so we get 19 over 120. So here, what we're concluding is that S sub 2 is within 1 over 1,000 of the true sum, S, which we don't know in this case. This case is one of those ones that don't tell us what it is. But. Any questions on that? Uh, why did we end up going with S2 when S when K3 generates the Okay, so K equals 3. If you think about your the way we're adding stuff up and where we're starting, <coughs> we're starting with 1, so we're adding up these terms like that. If you add the first 2, that's S sub 2, because what we found was that K equals 3 gave a term value that was less than 1 over 1,000. So the third term creates a value that's less than 1 over 1,000. So that's acting as the error for the sum of the previous terms. Oh, okay. So, so up I here, think what's confusing me is that, that S4 is within 1 1,000th of S. It's in the same color as the word for the next problem. 
Oh, 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 oh. So it looks like it's part of this problem, but it's not. Yeah, this this That's stuff good. is yeah, there. Because I saw two totally conflicting things that as far as it is within 1,000. And so up here, we got k is 5. So it was the fifth term that gave us less than 1,000. Mm -hmm. So we added up the four terms in front of that. So we added up s. So we formed s of 4. Yeah, I, I just thought that was part of the next one. So yeah, no, no problem. And uh, so that is our approximation right there. And this is how your calculator works. Your calculator uses infinite series for all of your transcendental functions, like sine, cosine, e to the x, natural log of x. All those functions have programmed in an infinite series. And if your screen has 10 decimal places, there's a little algorithm that figures out what the error is, and they go far enough out so that the error is not you know, pertinent for a 10 display device. That makes sense? So for all those transcendental functions, this is kind of what we're going to be looking at in the next chapter, is that we can write any transcendental function as an infinite series. And then if you have an infinite series, there's always going to be a formula for the error. The only error formula we're really going to look at in this class is this one, because this one is very, is very manageable. You just look at the absolute value of the next term. But given a more complicated type of series, there is a, a formula for the error. It's just more complicated, and we're not going to really analyze those. But the idea is the same. If you want to type into your calculator sine of pi over 5, you type it in. If there's 10 decimal places that your calculator goes to, there's a little computation that says, oh, you need to go out 32 um, terms in the series. And then you'll have an error that's less than uh, 10 decimal places. So same idea, though. The idea is, is very, very comparable to what we're doing. All right, so this is probably the most technical part of what we're going to do in this section. And it's, it's, a, it's only terminology, and we just have to be clear on this terminology. And I think, I, think it's, uh, I think it's manageable. So let's take a look at those two series right there. This series diverges, the harmonic. The alternating harmonic converges. And so what we're going to start talking about is a distinction between convergence and absolute convergence, All right. and conditional convergence. There's going to be three things. There's going to be convergence, absolute convergence, and conditional convergence. So let's take a look at this definition here. So if you turn all your terms positive, if that converges, then you say your original series converges absolutely. If you put the pot, if you make it absolute value and it diverges, but the original series converges, then series a sub k converges conditionally. So let's try to wrap our head around that. Okay. So if the series of absolute values converges, then the series without the val absolute values converges absolutely. So what that's telling us is the minuses don't matter. So when we look over here, the minuses matter. If you look at the series with absolute values, you get divergence. You need the minuses to subtract off enough that you get convergence. So here, what we say is that the alternating harmonic, this converges conditionally. Because you need the minuses. It does not converge absolutely. If it converged absolutely, you could turn all the minuses to plus, and you would still get convergence. Okay, So for a series to converge absolutely, it means make everything positive. And if that converges, if it still converges, that's going to be called absolute convergence. Okay, And if not, the series converges conditionally. So this series right here converges conditionally because if you put pluses in there, if you took away all the minuses, you'd get divergence. 
So it's it's a it's it's a smaller type of convergence. So let's look at some examples. Like we know one over k squared convergence, correct? One over k squared. So let's take a look at that series for a moment. Let's look at this series for a moment. So let's just say one over k squared, starting at one. That's one plus one fourth plus one ninth plus one sixteenth, etc. So we know that this series converges. It's the P series. Okay. But now let's consider the absolute, let's put in some uh, minuses. So what if we put in a switch here, made it minus 1 to the k plus 1 over k squared? Now you certainly would tell me that it converges. It's an alternating series, but the limit of a sub k is 0, and the terms are getting smaller in magnitude. You would, of course, say that it converges by AST. But let's look at it. So when k is 1, we're positive, so we have this. So the top one, we say that converges. Now this one has minuses in it. Are the minuses necessary? Could we make a stronger statement about its convergence? Is that series converging conditionally, or is it converging absolutely? absolutely. It's converging absolutely, because if we turn all the minuses into pluses, we still have convergence. So with conditional convergence, you have to have the minuses in there. If you don't have the minuses, the series inflates to infinity. But if you have the minuses in there, it offsets that, and it reduces the series to a finite value. So they're saying here that the terms go to 0 fast enough that the minuses don't even matter. You still would have convergence if you took away all the minuses if you turned all the minuses to pluses. So this one, we say, converges absolutely. So converging absolutely just means the series of absolute values converges. So it's a little stronger. Obviously, this original series, let's suppose it converges to pi squared over 6. If that converges to pi squared over, uh, that one up there, converges to pi squared over 6, if we put in minuses, that's going to converge to something that's smaller than pi squared over 6. Because we have some minuses in there subtracting from the pi squared over 6. Everyone follow that? So the series of absolute values, if that converges to pi squared over 6, the series that includes a minus every other term is going to converge to a number that's smaller than pi squared over 6. Make sense? So if the series without any minuses converges to 10, the series with minuses is going to converge to something less than 10. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely understanding. OK. So here is the little flow chart of what we're trying to discuss here. We've got an infinite series. If it diverges, it diverges. If it converges, we just want to classify the convergence. How strong does it converge? It can either converge absolutely or converge conditionally. So here, you need, you need help. You need the minuses. So without the minuses, you would get divergence. Here, minuses don't matter. So here, it converges even with all pluses. Okay, so if you turn every minus into a plus, it still converges. Okay, so that 
that's kind of a, it's subtle. It's not that complex, but it does take a little bit of practice reading it and rereading it and, and getting it. So let's try a couple of examples. So let's take a look at this alternating series. Let's write out the first few terms just so that we get a sense of what it looks like. Uh, plugging in one, it looks like our, our odd indexed terms will be negative. So this will be negative one, and then plus, when k is two, we get one over the square root of two, and then we get minus one over the square root of three, plus one over the square root of four, which I think I drew that one in my head, and then plus, I mean minus, one over the square root of five, et cetera. Okay. All right. So, does that series converge? Okay. So first off, is it an alternating series? Yeah. 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 Is it an alternating series with terms going to zero? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Is it an alternating series with magnitudes getting progressively smaller? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The sequence 1 over square root of k goes to 0. The limit of that is 0. So this is, this is a converging alternating series. The only time it really makes sense to classify your convergence is if you have minuses in there. Right? If you have all pluses anyway, convergence and absolute convergence mean the same thing, because the absolute values don't change the, the, don't change anything. It's when you have minuses in there that it really makes sense to talk about, well, how strong is your convergence? So we have a convergent alternating series. So now let's look at the series without the minuses in it. So if we simply turn all the minuses into pluses, then we have this series. And does that series converge or diverge? What was the answer? What's p equal to? One half. And p is less than 1, so it diverges. Correct? So this is a divergent p series. Because 1 half is less than 1. So that means that the series with the minuses, the original series, that convergence is conditional. So this is conditional convergence. <coughs> because you have divergence if you turn the minuses into pluses. sense? So if you have a convergent series, then you can decide whether it's absolutely convergent or conditionally convergent. Conditionally convergent means you need the minuses. The convergence is conditional on having some minuses to keep the sum from inflating to infinity. Let's take a look at this one. So let's just glance at some of the terms here, when k is, we start out with minus one third, and then when k is two, we get plus one ninth, and then minus one twenty seventh, plus et cetera. We get that. Is that a convergent or divergent alternating series? Convergent. Convergent alternating series. The terms are getting smaller in magnitude and going to zero. That's all the alternating series, that's all you need to conclude that there's convergence for an alternating series. The terms are getting smaller in magnitude and going to zero. That's all you need. So this is a convergent alternating series. Convergent alternating series. 
this. So then we ask, is that convergence conditional or absolute? So we consider what happens if we look at the series of absolute values. So we now consider the series that starts at 1, where we have 1 third to the k. It's, um, we've got that. So that series is a third plus a 9 plus a 27, etc. Does that series converge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, by what method? Geometric. Geometric, right? Geometric series. The R, right? When we look at that, there's a common ratio. What's our common ratio? One third. Yeah, we're multiplying by one third, multiplying by one third, multiplying by one third. So it's a geometric series with a common ratio of one third. And what is A equal to? One third also. Okay, so this is a convergent geometric series. R equals one third, which is less than one. Okay, so now we can make the classification of the original convergence. The original convergence, we can now conclude whether it's conditional or absolute. And what would we conclude? Absolute convergence. So there's absolute convergence because the series of absolute values also converges. So there, the minus, it doesn't matter. It converges even without the minuses. It's absolutely convergent. Converges no matter what. Even if you forget to put in the minuses, you get convergence. Let's take a look at this one. Again, let's write out the first few terms to get a sense. So it's starting at 2, so that means that the first term is going to be a positive term. 1 over the natural log of 2, and then minus 1 over the natural log of 3 plus 1 over the natural log of 4, minus 1 over the natural log of 5, plus etc. So does that series converge or diverge? It's an alternating series. Diverge. So it's alternating, so we have to ask the two questions. Are the terms getting smaller in magnitude? Yes, because the denominators are getting bigger, so the fraction values are getting smaller. Moreover, they're getting smaller and approaching zero. And as k goes to infinity, 1 over ln k is going to zero. So that denominator is getting bigger without any bound. Continuously getting bigger. OK, so this would be a convergent alternating series. Convergent alternating series. Now we can classify that convergence. So let's consider the series of positive terms. So the series of absolute values. So we, we get rid of the, the switch. So we have ln of k. So that's going to be just like that. Does that series converge? You think that series converges or diverges? Oh, what a terrible picture of LNX going through the origin. <laughs> Yikes. Totally fooled. Can we put all the final on that? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. That was. There we go. That's better. Okay, so do you think it converges or diverges? Diverges. So we know that if this was 1 over x, that's the harmonic, that diverges. ln of x is 
uh, is uh, going to infinity slower than 1 over x? <laughs> is there a mouse? It's over here. So it's going. It's your shoes, dude. So it's. It's not bothering me. The uh, series 1 over x is, is divergent because the terms go to 0, but they don't go to 0 fast enough. The, the denominators aren't going to infinity fast enough. ln of x in the denominator, that's going to infinity even slower than x is going to infinity which means those fractions are going to zero even slower than those fractions are going to zero. So this is going to diverge. So this is going to be a divergent series. <clears throat> and uh, you, you, we, we, this is kind of a comparison. If you brought like a, like a poster board of this downtown, like <laughs> you all laugh at people with a megaphone, people would think you're a cult. <laughs> Math is very cultish. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Healthy cult. Is there such a thing? Or does the word cult imply? I think anyone in the cult thinks it's healthy. Oh, good point. <laughs> so you're already in there. We're already in there. It seems healthy. <laughs> anyone, my son was just studying that crazy. Was it John? Jonestown? Jonestown. Jonestown. Jonestown or Jonestown? It's Jonestown. Jonestown? Jonestown, South Africa? Yeah. Uh, he had these horrifying photos up on the computer. I'm like, oh my gosh. Are you really old enough to understand this? <laughs> <laughs> yep, he's 15. Oh so freaky. Freaky, freaky. Okay, so we have a convergent alternating series. When we get rid of the minuses and turn them all positive, we have a divergent series. So what is true about the original convergence? Is it absolute or is it conditional? It is conditional. So that, uh, that convergence is conditional because when you look at the series of absolute values, you get divergence. So whenever we have convergence of an alternating series, we can ask this question. Is it absolute? Or is it? Oh. <laughs> two minutes. Can I really let you out two minutes early? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Why not? <laughs> two minutes. I'll make it up on the exam. <laughs> <laughs> we just learned another question, guys. <laughs> can the final 